The east coast of Australia was undoubtedly hit numerous times in history by tsunamis of varying heights. In the last video we looked at a mega tsunami that struck Jervis Bay with it originating from the southeast. The link to this video will be down in the description and in the pinned comment below. In this video we're going to continue our journey up past Sydney, beginning in Newcastle. I was originally going to cover the tsunami damage that exists in far north Queensland, and I still intend to in the near future. But after receiving many comments about the evidence of tsunamogenic deposits past Sydney, I decided to take a closer look at what exists. The peer-reviewed study, Geological Indicators of Large Tsunami in Australia, released in 2001, documents the fact that tsunami deposits exist in a 400 km stretch of coastline in New South Wales. I'll put the link to this paper in the description. Whilst I can't show the map included in the study due to copyright reasons, the paper details that tsunami deposits exist from north of Sydney down to Jervis Bay and stretch all the way down to Tura Point. This tsunami has also hit Lord Howe Island, and I'll make a separate video on this. The evidence has been widely published in Bryant et al. 1992-1996, Young and Bryant 1992, Young et al. 1995 and 1996, and Bryant and Young 1996. The prevailing wind direction from Sydney down to Tura Point goes from a west direction to a southwesterly direction. As you will see in this video, this goes against the chevron directions that we will look at, which are deposited in a manner that points to the northwest. In the last video, it became clear that the tsunami that we covered came from the southeast and smashed the area of Jervis Bay from that direction. It deposited parabolic dune chevrons up to 130 meters high. These features are not Aeolian dunes, because they contain numerous pebbles and gravel along with massive boulders of impressive size that were deposited high up over 80 metres beyond the cliff faces. It's likely that the tsunami grew in height as it became funnelled into the bay, which increases the run-up height of tsunamis. This video will serve two purposes. First we'll look at a few different areas that stick out to me. Following this, we'll look into the processes that form tsunamogenic deposits and then we'll explore the difference between these deposits and those formed from natural processes like wind, wave and storm action. One thing to point out is that as we head further north, the directional nature of chevrons will slowly turn from being northwest facing to just under north facing, before they no longer hit Australia. We will scour the coastline of Newcastle up to a point called Seals Rock. It's worth noting that we are attempting to follow the tsunami that struck Jervis Bay, which came from a southeast direction and occurred within the past 1050 years. But I will also show you some formations that look like they were deposited from a different, possibly older tsunami. One last thing to note is that I am only showing you what may be tsunami based damage. Field study is needed to grant them the label and to reach a conclusive finding. But there are some telling signs that I will outline for you in this video. But first, what about Sydney? Well, the study details that Sydney was also the site of tsunami impacts, but much of the city has hidden any trace of tsunamogenic damage. There is one possible site that might hint to a tsunami at Endeavour Heights Reserve. If we look at the geological maps, we have scoured bedrock existing here. These bedrock mantling dune fasces were seen in Jervis Bay. The cliff faces here are only 30 metres or so high, and we have parabolic dune chevrons that rise to a maximum height of 50 metres in certain parts. The dunes themselves are a mix of marine and terrestrial sediments. Tsunamis can deposit a mix of marine and terrestrial sediments, but these deposits are typically associated with tsunami run-up zones rather than aeolian processes. Tsunami deposits are characterised by a chaotic mix of materials, including marine shells, sand, gravel and terrestrial debris, and are usually found in low-lying coastal areas affected by the wave's impact. There are fluted features seen on the bedrock here, and there's also less dense and scattered vegetations and pool features which may hint to tsunami damage. After this, the New South Wales Golf Course has removed any trace of possible chevrons, but the geological map also lists the area as being bedrock mantling dune fasces. But let's head north now to the Newcastle area. Stockton Beach features something extraordinary. We have these massive chevron shaped dunes here. But what's more telling is the fact that the dune fasces extend 10 kilometers inland on geological maps. This is very telling. Another thing that's interesting is a mix of marine and terrestrial sediments are listed as occurring in these dunes. It could be inferred that the deposits have a possible tsunamogenic origin. One would need to dig through them to properly classify them as tsunamogenic, but their stretch of 10 kilometers inland is a telling sign that they may be related to a tsunami. The Tamago sand beds reach a maximum height of 30 meters. 
we have another smaller dune chevron deposition at Samurai Beach. After this, we have another interesting feature. Notice these sand dunes here don't stretch all the way from the beginning of this beach. There is a possibility that we are witnessing what is known as the shadow effect here, where an area is spared from the brunt of the wave by land masses that were in the direct line of the impact by the wave. The Yakaba headlands rises to 170 meters. As you can see, there are no sand dunes in a line where the Yukaba headlands shelter the region, only for them to briefly appear, then disappear again, as a result of Cabbage Tree Island being in the way. Fluted features are seen on the bedrock here on the southeastern side of the island, and Boondalbar Island has similar features. Little Island is nothing but bedrock. If we take a moment to consider the locations of these three islands and the Yakaba headlands, a very interesting thing appears. The sand dunes diminish in size in the areas where the wave hit from the southeast, only to become most apparent when there was nothing in the wave's line of direct impact. Beach deposits exist here that stretch about 8 kilometers inland. When taking all of this into account, this is an area of very peculiar interest, and it would be worth digging the dunes themselves to see if they contain tsunamogenic deposits, which to this point hasn't happened. What has happened, however, is smaller geological sampling of the areas that stretch 8 kilometers inland. They contain fine to coarse grain sand, seashell fragments, and gravel. These are the things one would expect to see in tsunami deposits, as wind-formed deposits don't contain gravel. The type of gravel seen here is known as polymictic gravel. Polymictic gravel is a type of gravel that is composed of a mixture of clasts or fragments of different rock types. The term polymictic comes from Greek roots, meaning many mixtures, indicating the diverse origin of the gravel components. Now, to be fair, rivers carry polymictic gravel, but seeing beach ridge deposits this far inland is a sign that some high energy event swept these deposits inland. And of course, tsunamis can carry polymictic gravel. The high energy and force of a tsunami can erode, transport, and deposit a wide variety of sediments, including gravel of different rock types. I wouldn't be too surprised if beach ridge deposits were found near to the beach, but to find it 8 kilometers inland is very strange in my eyes. As a side note, if you're enjoying this video, please click the like button to help YouTube recommend it to others. Consider subscribing and clicking the bell icon to be notified of when we upload. We also have a Patreon if you'd like to support the channel, and you can find that in the description below. After this, we have another example of the shadow effect due to Broughton and Little Broughton Island before 30 meter high sand dunes suddenly appear again. I do not believe this is a coincidence. This is the second time we have seen this. But before we continue, we need to look at something very interesting. Beach deposits extend almost 20 kilometers inland from this point, and they contain the same mix as before. Find a coarse grain sand, shell fragments, and polymictic gravel. It's right along the river, so the gravel could be from there, but it doesn't explain the seashells. If these are tsunamogenic in their origin, which appears highly likely due to how far inland they stretch, the reason for their impressive surge inland is due to the lake that exists here, which is the lowest point, allowing the wave to surge inland and over the lake up through the river systems that exist here. We have now reached the area where I believe this tsunami ends, at Seal Rocks. It's worth noting the direction of the sand dunes. They are increasingly facing north as we moved up the New South Wales coastline. I want to quickly show you areas that were spared from the tsunami. These areas do not contain the same geological features that we saw in the other areas. They lack any inland penetration of sand dunes. Notice how different the coastline looks. Now I'm going to show you areas that I believe were deposited by an unrelated tsunami that I suspect was much older. At this area, I firstly laughed at the name as my inner child came out, but I also became interested in the beach ridge deposits that are 7 to 8 kilometers inland. The coastline bears no mark of any tsunami-based damage, leading me to suspect it could be a much older tsunami that deposited these seashell and gravel-rich sand dunes. Again, look at how different the rest of the coastlines here are. They do not look disturbed. This is the typical appearance they take when no possible tsunami-based damage has occurred. So before we go into the details regarding the signatures that tsunami waves can create, I want to point your attention to Hat Head. This beach has chevrons that now face a western direction, leading me to suspect another tsunami has occurred here from a different origin than the one that hit Jervis Bay. Shell material has been deposited about 8 kilometers inland here, and the next bay looks similarly disturbed. Now we'll look at one site that I believe is worth mentioning. Further north at Illaru Group Camping Spot, we have these features. A possible tsunami of up to 80 meters in height might have occurred here, 
vegetative regrowth has grown on what appears to be ancient chevrons. A cross section reveals these parabolic dunes vary from 58 to 78 metres high. The land here drastically rises to 130 metres, which might have served to block any further inland penetration. Now let's look into more detail at how tsunami waves can create four general categories of depositional and erosional signatures that distinguish them from storm waves. To start, we can use these depositional signatures to distinguish imbricated boulders deposited within coarse-grained sediment and geomorphic forms, which are much closer to the surface. Moreover, most of the identifiable sedimentary deposits are not very conspicuous in the landscape and cannot be detected without fieldwork or more detailed studies. If an imbricated boulder train is not exposed at the Earth's surface, it won't trigger the same sense of wonder and the associated puzzle about how it got there. Both the sand laminae and the sand layers with boulders are buried below the surface. Depending on the depth a sedimentary tsunami deposit is buried, it might not be conspicuous in the landscape either. Without detailed study, they might be interpreted as a product of some other, more familiar geomorphic process. Consider the sand laminae. In the scientific literature, those deposited by a tsunami are often described as an impression structure. But although these thin bedded unstratified sand layers can form during severe storms or the processes of storm overwash, wave ripple or density currents, thick sand laminae of more than 30 centimeters in thickness are most commonly associated with tsunamis. Sand laminae or lenses can be very thin and hard to detect. In fact, some of these sedimentary layering structures amount to just a few millimetres to a few centimetres of sand. Typical sand laminates are layered following the orientation of the waves that deposited the lithified sediments. These layers demonstrate a distinct grain size contrast with overlying sediment, ranging from clay to coarse grain sand. What this means is that many of the sand layers that are listed on geological maps as being wind-formed are done so by eye, rather than by examination. This is an issue because it omits any potential tsunamogenic evidence. The sand dunes themselves need to be dug and investigated to prove a tsunami origin, and this is something that is scarcely being done. This is why the directional features that are present on maps are important. They go against the direction of prevailing winds, and instead they're deposited in line with the tsunami that originated from a southeastern direction. If these are wind formed, they should either point to the west or to the southwest, but they don't they point to the northwest. Chaotic sediment mixtures or dump deposits can also be challenging to interpret. These deposits can form from various processes, including solar fluxion, ice push, human disturbance or slope wash. Solar fluxion is the slow downhill flow of water saturated soil over a frozen or impermeable layer, typically occurring in cold climates with permafrost or seasonal frost. However, in coastal areas without ice, ground freezing or human disturbance, such deposits can be attributed to catastrophic tsunamis capable of transporting and depositing large volumes of sediment with minimal sorting in a short period. Coarser dump deposits, often containing cobbles and boulders, are typically found plastered against the sides or on top of the headlands. These deposits might be mistaken for storm deposits, but several factors differentiate them. Storm waves tend to separate sand and boulder materials, with storms combing sand from beaches into the nearshore zone and moving cobbles and boulders landward to form storm berms. While exceptional storms might toss sediment onto clifftops more than 15 metres above sea level, tsunami dump deposits can be found on cliffs much higher, of between 20 to 30 metres, and in sheltered positions. Tsunamis generated by submarine landslides can deposit mixed sand and boulder material to considerable elevations. For instance, on the island of Lanai in Hawaii, such deposits have been found several hundred metres above sea level. Enigmatic deposits on headlands, labelled smear deposits, are spread in thin layers, less than 30 centimetres over the steep sides and flatter tops of the headlands reaching elevations of 20 to 30 metres above sea level. These deposits contain 5 to 20% sand, shell and gravel, and are not products of in situ weathering as they often contain quartz sand not found in the underlying bedrock of volcanic sandstone or basalt. These smear deposits form the traction carpet at the base of sediment rich flows over washing headlands. The most dramatic tsunami deposits are large boulders piled above the level of storm waves. These boulders, up to 106 metres cubed in volume and weighing as much as 286 tonnes, are imbricated and stacked in parallel lines along the east coast of Australia. For example, at Jervis Bay, blocks weighing almost 100 tonnes have been moved in suspension above storm wave limits to cliff tops 33 metres above sea level. 
These boulders are orientated according to the direction of the tsunami wave approach, not at right angles to the cliff line, indicating the immense power of tsunami overwash. Hydrological calculations confirm that only tsunamis and not storm waves have the power to move such large blocks onto cliffs. These parallel imbricated boulder piles are the unmistakable signature of tsunami overwash. Except for karst land which represents the planing or smoothing of raised estuarine surfaces by tsunami runup, tsunami depositional forms could be misinterpreted as features built by swell or storm waves. However, their internal fabric and chronostratigraphy differ from those produced by storm waves. For example, ridges and mounds above the high tide line at Bass Point contain chaotic mixtures of boulders, gravels, sand and shell, with steep sides combed down by storm waves. These landforms with their wide range of grain sizes bear no resemblance to storm or swell wave deposits described in the sedimentological literature. Their closest analogue is an ice push ridge, but the New South Wales coast is unaffected by ice push processes. Chronological inconsistencies have been identified at over eight sites along the southeast coast. One notable example is a Holocene barrier at Bilambi, 60 kilometres south of Sydney. This barrier, seemingly formed by the Holocene marine transgression within the last 6,000 years, contains sands dated to over 22,000 before present, based on thermoluminescent dating. Pumice within the deposit dates to the same age. These old sands, however, overlay estuarine sediments radiocarbon dated to 6,560 before present. The sands were originally windblown material deposited on the shelf when sea levels were lower during the last glacial period. Recently, they were swept from their shelf by tsunamis and deposited at the shore as a barrier feature without resetting their TL clock. Tsunamis have occurred here at approximately 6,500, 2,900, 1,500, 900, and 222 to 250 before present. The most significant events in terms of size and extent took place around 6,500 before present and 900 before present both having a major impact on the coastal evolution over more than 400 kilometers of coastline. So the last areas that we looked at in this video might be from the tsunami of 6,500 before present, due to the vegetative regrowth that has occurred, whereas the more obvious dune chevrons could be from 900 before present. Only three mechanisms can generate waves large enough to create the features found around the Australian coastline. Submarine landslides, meteorites crashing into or exploding over the ocean, and large submarine volcanic eruptions. While all three factors are possible, especially for the south coast of New South Wales, the fragmentation of a large meteorite impacting the oceans around Australia is the only mechanism that can explain the coincidence in dates. Huggett 1989 calculated that an object as small as 0.2 kilometers in diameter crashing into the ocean could produce tsunamis with run-up heights of 10 to 100 meters. Meteorites of this size have a theoretical recurrence interval for the Pacific Ocean of 24,000 to 43,000 years. Smaller objects can also generate tsunamis, but with greater frequency. Indigenous stories also describe the impact of meteorites. From a risk perspective, the occurrence of cosmogenic megatsunamis is ambiguous. However, without such a mechanism, one must conclude that megatsunamis may be a natural and regular geological induced feature of the Australian coastline. So I hope you enjoyed this detailed look into the tsunamigenic damage of Eastern Australia. We'll continue this journey in future videos. And as always, thanks for watching. Are you interested in animals? I've just started a second channel called Paleozoology that discusses extinct and extant animals with a current focus on the megafauna that once dominated and roamed Australia. I've released a video on the marsupial lion which existed in Australia during the time Indigenous Australians walked the continent. I've also covered the wombat that was the size of a car, known as the Diprotodon, or the largest terrestrial lizard known as the Megalania. I'd love to have you along for the journey as more videos are released. You can find a link to this channel and to the aforementioned videos in the description and in the pinned comment in the comment section. Before I end this video, I'd like to give a big shout out to my Patreon and YouTube members. Thank you so much to everyone that helps to support this channel.